Well, good afternoon. I know most of you, but in case you don't know me, I'm Nancy Fisher in the Department of Sociology, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you all this afternoon to the annual Torstenson Lecture. The Torstenson Lecture is named after Joel Torstenson, and he helped found Oxford Sociology Department back in 1947. He also helped found the uh, Metro Urban Studies Program and the Social Work Department here at Oxford. The annual Torstenson Lecture in Sociology promotes the field of sociology and Oxford's contribution to the field through the sharing and exchange of ideas between the Oxford community and invited guest lecturers. Today's invited guest lecturer is Greg Owen. Greg Owen has served as a consulting scientist at Wilder Research, which is a nonprofit applied human services research organization in St. Paul. He received his PhD in sociology from the University of Minnesota in 1982. He's led a wide range of research projects at Wilder since 1989, including studies of welfare reform, delinquency, child maltreatment, homelessness, and access to preventative health care. He currently leads a team of 11 researchers and serves as principal investigator for a number of projects including the evaluation of Minsky's Centers of Excellence, a statewide study of homelessness, a multi-year study of supportive housing in Minnesota, an evaluation of the Living Cities Initiative, and a Lilly-funded study of vocational choice among college students, including students here at Oxford. Um, Greg's recent publications include a wide range of research reports and monographs, book chapters, on child maltreatment, welfare reform, homelessness, hospice care, AIDS, and bereavement. Based on work with Augsburg College, Luther, and Augustana, Greg and his colleagues Ellen Shelton and Brian Pittman recently published Called for Life, an evaluation of college programs to support vocational discernment, which I'm sure you will tell us something about. So I'd like you to all join me in welcoming Greg up. pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be asked to give this talk uh, in the name of Joel Torstensen. Um, I'm just curious, uh, before I begin, how many of the folks that are here today uh, have had experience with um, vocational discernment activities or classes at Oxford? Interesting, okay. And, um, uh, how many of you are sociology students? Mandated to be here I want to start by talking a little bit about um, Joel Torstensen because I, uh, I did a little bit of background work on him before uh, coming here tonight after Tim asked me. I, I really appreciate Tim that you're, you've asked me to do this and I, I know it was based on appearing in one class talking about our study of homelessness. But um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Joel's background because I think it, it really helps us to think about the whole idea of vocational discernment um, and the idea of sociology as a vocation, which is the title that I've picked for this talk tonight. Um, how many of you have heard of the Wilder Foundation? It's a St. Paul organization. Um, uh, maybe I'll just ask, in what context do you know Wilder? Any of you who raised your hand? What, what, what is it that Wilder does that you know something about? Training. Training. We do provide training. We have leadership training, youth leadership initiatives. Providing statistics um, regarding the metro area. Right. We have sort of <coughs> unlimited statistics that you can find on our website. <laughs> yes. Um, Anything else? Any other activities? Housing. Housing. Wilder well, provides supportive housing now. We've gotten out of a large part of our market rate housing work, but we now do provide supportive housing. Um, and we provide a lot of other direct services. Clinical services for children, mental health services, school-based mental health services. So one of the aspects that I'd like to talk about a bit tonight is this whole connection between being in the world of service delivery and the needs of individuals and the work that you can do as a sociologist or social scientist, whether you're an economist or psychologist, in trying to strengthen those services, make them better, improve the lives of individuals. 
um, because that's what the life of an applied social scientist is about, and, and that's what we'll focus on tonight. Um, I'm wondering if, if someone could get me a glass of water. I'd love to have a glass of water here because I can already, I've been talking all day and I can already feel my life, my mouth kind of um, drying up on me. So. You probably get one right in the kitchen there, but I don't know. No, there was a kitchen there. <laughs> <laughs> So first, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. David Tedi. I don't know if many of you know that name, um, but uh, David was one of the fellows that worked with us on the Call for Life initiative and another project at Luther Seminary called Centered Life, which was about uh, discerning a vocation. Um, and David is uh, one of the persons that, I, when I mentioned the Torstensen lecture, he sort of unleashed uh, uh, a bit of information on me about Joel Torstensen and his centrality to the Department of Sociology here. So um, I did take some time to look up some facts about Joel, and, and this is what I found. First, he was an undergraduate in history here during the 1930s, and he taught his first course here in 1937 while he was still an undergraduate. And that kind of resonated with me because I remember getting to graduate school at the University of Minnesota where I graduated from, and within the first year, as a first year graduate student, they had asked me to teach a, cl a class because they didn't have anyone to teach the course. And I taught the class Sex, Romance, and Relationships. Um, as a first year graduate student, my wife, of course, asked me what, what did I think I not knew about that. Um, uh, and, and I really have to say that I didn't feel like I knew a lot, but I had to do a lot of background research in order to be ready to, to teach that class. Joel earned, thank you. Oh, great. Double like a camel um, <laughs> uh, Joel earned his master's and PhD in sociology at the U of M, the same place that I spent my time, and established, as our introducer told us, uh, the Departments of Social Work and Sociology here at Oxford. He was a pacifist. He established a cooperative farm community in the 1940s. He served on the American Lutheran Church's Rural Life Commission, which is something I had some contact with even while I was at the University of Minnesota. He introduced industrial relations to the social science curriculum here. He led student immersion programs, I think even before we had names like student immersion programs, he was leading those here. And he had an undying interest in preparing students for service. He retired from Oxford the year before I started my career at Wilder. Thank you. Uh, I, I started at Wilder in 1979, so I've been there a little over 30 years. He started his career here, in, he, he retired from Oxford in 1978, but did not die until age 95 in 2007. And it just so happens I'm providing support and help to an older adult that goes to my church. His name is Al Carlson. And uh, he uh, is 96 years old now. We just transitioned him from, assist from his home to assisted living, which was a major transition since he was one of those people that could never throw anything out. And so his house was filled. He only had four categories of things that he had uh, in the seven file cabinets with five drawers each that was in his house. There were only four categories of things that were filed. Save, keep, important, or safe forever. <laughs> I also learned that Joel Torstensen's daughter, Carol, lived just, lives just a few miles from where I grew up in New Hampshire. She lives in Warner, New Hampshire. I grew up in Concord, New Hampshire. So I came away from this little review of Joel Torstensen with a, a few thoughts. I guess first thought was, well, here was a man really engaged. He pursued things consistent with his values and found that his life intersected with really significant social issues. Second, here was a man who appreciated this passionate and rigorous inquiry. That's why people pursue social sciences or physical sciences or any sciences because there's some appreciation of dispassion and rigor in the inquiry, but who was indeed interested in fostering compassionate and sympathetic concern among his students and colleagues. Um, and this is one of the hallmarks, I think, that represents the applied researcher, too. And that is that while you may be, wish to be dispassionate in your inquiry and 
objective in the way in which you seek information to focus on your problem. The very selection of the problems that you have to, uh, to focus on, the very, the very decisions that you make about which areas you wish to study are informed by your values. And I think this was true as I read the background on Joel. Finally, uh, here was a man whose life beautifully illustrated what it meant to have a vocation. And I want to say a little bit about that. And, and I guess maybe before I start, because I know Augsburg has this program that is in, in asking students to reflect on vocation, what is it that you think about when you think about vocation? Any just words that come to mind? You can Anyone that has a thought about that. Maybe something that you've heard in class, something that you've incorporated into your heart. What does vocation mean? A life passion. Okay, so there's something that you feel strongly about. Other thoughts? A calling. A calling. And a calling, like, calling, that sounds like from someplace other than just you. A calling that perhaps that you're drawn to something from some, whether it's a spiritual calling, uh, whether it is a calling, uh, some sense from within yourself or from outside of you uh, that you are drawn to. To, to, to attack or, or to uh, attend to a particular issue. What else? What else is, goes with vocation? Work. Work. Yes, work. <laughs> vocation is work. Um, <clears throat> the way in which we formulated it uh, from our discussions with the Augsburg and the Augustana um, and the Luther College uh, faculty that were involved in this was it involves discerning how the needs of the world intersect with one own, one's own gifts and talents and passions. And to find in that a path that is uniquely one's own, inspired by something that is not just you. So, I have a strong interest in vocation, and David Teedy and Jack Fortin and Rick Torgerson at Luther College and others here at Oxford have helped me think about this. But I'm going to step back from it for just a minute because I want to tell you a little bit about the path by which I ended up being an applied social scientist and some of the ways in which the work that I encountered influenced me. So I started at the University of Minnesota uh, and I was working with two advisors. I was one of those students that just was not happy with just one advisor, so I asked two faculty, and apparently it was unusual, they didn't like the idea, but they finally both agreed. One of my advisors was Don Martindale. He was a social theorist. And Don was, a, was just a, what I consider a renaissance scholar. Uh, the books and the publications that Don produced were basically an inspiration for a young graduate student to think about thinking this deeply about the formation of civilization, the issues around social control, the social forces of, of, that were at work uh, in the lives and in the, in the cultures that we um, were beginning to understand and appreciate. But the other advisor was Robert Fulton. And Robert Fulton was sort of the sociology of death father. And so one would say, well, what did you, why did you end up in death? Well, um, the short answer was there was an opportunity for a free fellowship, and so I took it. And I didn't know how much I was invested in this topic. But as it turns out, it was really a fortuitous circumstance because I got to really write my very first applied research piece based on that work, and that was on grief therapy. This was at a time before long, this was just when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was just starting out, when the first hospice program was afoot in the United Kingdom, uh, Cicely Saunders St. Christopher's Hospice. And we were just beginning to think about what social scientists were called the denial of death. And it was because we were growing up in a culture in which most people, by the time they reached 20 years of age, or even a bit older, often had never experienced the death of someone close. Death had become so controlled, uh, and we had, been, we had so mastered uh, issues related to public health, that quite often people would get to the age of 20 plus and not have experienced the death that was close to them.